There's a lot of different kinds of horror. The main two most people really know are Western horror and Japanese horror, but there's actually a lot of subgenres on either side of the ocean. Lovecraft horror, a subgenre created by author H.P. Lovecraft, is a genre with heavy focus on the occult and blasphemous monsters, but most importantly, the unfathomable fear of the unknown. Greater forces the human mind couldn't possibly comprehend. This idea of being a tiny speck in a universe of greater power. Hours. The genre is most well known for the flagship character Cthulhu, but a lot of other media have made up their own characters and lore and have used the same Lovecraftian concepts. Possibly the most recognized video game to do this, being Lovecraft inspired but not actually using the Cthulhu mythos, was a Nintendo published game of all things called Eternal Darkness. The game was originally going to be on the N64. In fact, I actually remember seeing it advertised on the back of the box the day I got mine for Christmas. It was the first ever M-rated game published by Nintendo, the second one being Geist, also for the GameCube in 2005. Nintendo wouldn't publish another one until Bayonetta 2. I always loved how GameCube games started up with that iconic Nintendo logo with a unique sound effect for every game. Nintendo. Oh, hearing the words Nintendo in that voice? Oh boy, you know you're in for something a little different this time. It was developed by a team called Silicon Knights, most well known for their work on the Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes remake, and that ugly lawsuit against Epic Games over to Human that crippled the company. Not a good move, guys. These guys have definitely lost their touch as years went on, but back in their prime, they made a handful of decent titles. I first played the game way back in high school after finding a used copy. It was always one of those weird GameCube games that every Everybody seemed to know about, but it was really hard to find someone who actually played it or have beaten it. Uh, yeah, the one with the blue screen of death, right? Everybody knew it for those cool fourth wall game breaking game mechanics, and when it came out, it was critically acclaimed and highly praised for pioneering all of these cool new ideas. It's been 15 years since all of that happened, since this game launched, so why don't we take a look back and see if it still holds up. The game follows a young girl named Alex who's called to her grandfather's mansion on Rhode Island to identify his body. He's been murdered, brutally at that, and Alex refuses to leave the mansion until she finds out what exactly happened to him. She stumbles across a hidden room in the mansion and discovers an ancient book called The Tome of Eternal Darkness. Reading through it, she learns of a plot coined by a Roman military commander, Pius Augustus, 2,000 years ago to summon an ancient deity that would plunge the entire world into eternal darkness. As Alex discovers more and more hidden pages from the tome, she'll read into the accounts of different figures throughout time that all fought against Pius's plot. As such, the game is split into many different chapters, each of which will have you take control of a different character from a different time period, all the way from 26 BC to the year 2000. Yeah, this game's plot takes place over the course of 2026 years. The first chapter focuses on Pius Augustus, showing how he stumbled upon the means to summon one of the ancient gods, which in turn corrupted him and transformed him into this immortal undead sorcerer dude. What's super cool about this game is you actually get to choose which of the three ancient gods Pius tries to summon, which will create a lot of subtle differences throughout the game. The god he talks to in the cutscenes, what kind of enemies you'll face, and what you'll have to do to defeat it. Between every chapter, you'll go back to playing as Alex within the mansion, and you'll use new abilities she's learned from reading about the previous character to unlock new parts of the mansion, and in turn, finding the next page of the tome. For example, she might read about somebody that'll learn a brand new spell that she can now use in the mansion to unlock unlock maybe a new room she couldn't go to before and find a new chapter of the tome. I really like this structure. It feels really satisfying to constantly come back to Alex in the mansion and slowly whittle your way to the end of it. Including Alex and Pius, there's a whopping 12 playable characters total. We've got Elia, a Cambodian slave girl from 1150, Antony, a messenger for Charlemagne in 814, Karim, a Persian swordsman from 565, Maximilian Royvis, Alex's ancestor and previous owner of the mansion in 1760, Edwin Lindsay, an archaeologist exploring the Cambodian ruins in 1983, Paul Luther, a Franciscan monk in 1485, Roberto Bianchi, a Venetian architect from 1460, Peter Jacob, a World War I reporter in 1916, Michael Edwards, a badass Canadian firefighter out of the early 90s, and finally, Edward Royvis, Alex's grandfather, during his efforts to seal away the ancients in the 1950s. The game's got a great variety in 
Victorian settings, and the story all ties together fairly well, with a lot of the characters that exist in the 20th century bringing their finds back to Edward Royvis, pooling their resources in one place so Alex could be the one to find it in the year 2000 and be the one to finally end Pius's plan. Every character also has slightly different stats, you know, running speed, health, stamina, really hated playing as Roberto, he, he just goes so slow. You're definitely gonna like certain characters more than others. Michael Edwards was my favorite. Not only is he a fellow Canadian, but he's a badass firefighter that fights demons with a fire axe, and on top of that, he sports a machine gun that's great for ripping through monsters. It's the only time in the game you're ever gonna get to feel like a badass. The gameplay itself is gonna feel vaguely familiar for Silent Hill fans. We've got those skewed camera angles, giving you many warped perspectives. The game does use traditional analog control, though, instead of tank controls, and while I did criticize Silent Hill 4 and Origins for this, since the camera angles suddenly change and that makes the controls a little wonky for camera transitions, Eternal Darkness has found a solid remedy for this without using tank controls. The game's camera never cuts between angles, but rather it'll smoothly transition by moving into place, depending on where the character is standing. It sounds a little dizzying, you know, with the high up camera angles and the Dutch tilts, but it's very well done. The camera work really hits that mark with the weird Silent Hill angles, but manages to be free flowing enough to make the controls feel consistent. Silent Hill 4 really could have benefited from this kind of camera system. I mean, that game came out after this one after all, you know, couldn't have looked at this, took some notes, Konami, whatever. The game's structure is also kind of like Silent Hill, but it's a little bit more linear, you know, finding a series of keys in the shape of various items, finding a way forward using those items, yada yada yada, you know, classic survival horror gameplay. What makes the game more linear is that, since it's chapter based, every area is fairly small, and I do somewhat like this. It makes it very easy to memorize the map. I mean, in fact, I had no idea there even was an in-game map until my third playthrough for this video. I, I never needed it. The combat that does play very differently though. Like Silent Hill, you've got ranged and melee weapons, but to ready the weapon, you'll hold down the R button and that'll lock you onto an enemy. You'll then tilt the control stick in one of three directions to target a certain body part. Holding the control stick up will aim for the head, left and right will aim for the arms, and leaving it centered will attack the torso. By knocking off an enemy's head, they'll no longer be able to see, and that'll make it really easy to dodge attacks. But if you knock off their arms, they won't be able to attack at all. It's a little bit clunky and will take some getting used to, but once you've got the hang of it, you'll be rushing in, chopping off heads, stepping back to dodge, rinse and repeat, and you've pretty much got the combat down. Honestly, it feels a lot more like an action game than a survival game. It's way too easy just to mow down enemies. And on top of that, the enemies really don't take very long to kill either. Two bops to the head and two bops to the body, and you've pretty much got them dead. In fact, I found the melee weapons to be way more helpful than the ranged weapons. It's so easy to dodge attacks, they're so slow, and I never felt the need to stay far back. It just becomes something that'll take longer to kill enemies with, and will use up resources. I mean, you will need guns later in the game, when the harder enemies become the norm, like when you're playing as Ed Royvis and Michael Edwards, but for the grand majority of the game, melee weapons are gonna be your go-to. And now, of course, the one thing that makes this game so freaking unique. The sanity system. It's a Lovecraft and game after all, and what's Lovecraft without some sort of mechanic revolving sanity? You've got a green bar that represents this. You'll lose sanity for every monster you'll see, which is represented by their glowing eyes, this little light projecting from their heads. This is why I always go for the head first, because it's actually possible to chop off their heads before they can do this. As your sanity gets lower and lower, the camera angle will get more and more tilted. You'll start to hear voices, whispering, crying, and the game will then start to play tricks on on you. Some of these are just weird and horrific things, like blood dripping from the ceiling, subtle environmental changes, and maybe your head will fall off. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms. I remember one time I was playing the game and I walked into another room and there was just ammunition all over the floor and I was like, nice, so I started picking it up and then the game's like, Pfft. no, there's no ammo, you're just kidding, there's, there's none, there's no ammo, idiot. One time I opened the pause menu and all of my items were gone, 
Nah, dog. I just kidding. I just messing with you. They're still there. Don't worry. The most interesting ones are the ones that break the fourth wall in really cool ways. Things like the game tricking you into thinking the volume's being turned down or muting the TV, like someone sat on your remote or something. Maybe they'll have bugs crawl on the TV screen. Some of them are a little outdated now. I mean, if you're playing on an HD TV, they're not really going to be that convincing. But for its time, and even still now, these were crazy cool. Some of them are pretty timeless, though, like the one that tells you your controller was disconnected as enemies kill you and you just can't do anything about it because the controller won't work anymore. There's tons of brilliant ones like this sprinkled all throughout the game. It's kind of like they just took Psycho Mantis and made a full game out of it. Did you enjoy playing Eternal Darkness? You'll recover your sanity by either casting spells, which I'll get into more later, or by performing a finishing move on an enemy. Perhaps you become more at ease by knowing the world is free of another blasphemous creature. Though the finishing moves, they look kind of lame. This isn't really happening. If your sanity gets to zero, your health will start to drain, but other than that, there's really no penalty to having a low sanity. It just makes these cool fourth wall things happen, and that really makes me wonder why it's presented as such an important thing to maintain your sanity as it is important to maintain your health. I mean, chances are you're playing this game for the sanity stuff, right? If you want to see any of that, you'll have to intentionally keep your sanity pretty low by really not playing the game as intended. It's just a super weird design choice. These awesome fourth wall experiences are treated as a punishment rather than a reward. Perhaps the most infamous one is when it gives you a fake blue screen of death, though in my three playthroughs of this game it's never happened to me. I've had a lot of people tell me it only happens if you really don't save the game for a long time, so that could explain it. I save very often because when you die, you return to the title screen. If you haven't saved in a while and you get yourself killed, you could end up having to do a lot of stuff all over. I remember the first time I played this game, I had no idea the game did not autosave, and nothing really reminded me to save, like there's no save points or anything like Silent Hill, so I ended up dying and losing two hours of progress. And that wouldn't be so bad if you could skip the cutscenes, which you can't, and that's really annoying. So yeah, pro tip if you play this game, save often. You can do it from the pause screen at any point in time, as long as there's no enemies in the room. Overall, I never really found this game to be incredibly scary. The monsters never really did much for me, but it definitely does create a fairly eerie atmosphere, especially with the sound design. As your sanity lowers, you'll hear loud knocking, and that used to get me when I was playing alone at night. The knocking's designed to sound like it's coming from your room and not the game, and that's pretty cool. One little trick they do a lot is having torches spark. It's always really loud and startles me just enough to remind me that, okay, maybe I am a little on edge. Okay, so the game's not like super scary, but I guess I'd be pretty hard pressed to say it's not a scary game at all. It doesn't come close to approaching Silent Hill levels, but it's much better at horror than a lot of modern games in the genre. You know, the game relies on atmosphere and absurdities instead of jump scares. Okay, maybe there's that one, but I promise it's the only one in the game. When you're in the bathroom and you inspect the bathtub, instead of a text box appearing like you'd expect, it just does this really dumb jump scare that catches you completely off guard, and it'll make you poop your pants if you don't see it coming. So, uh, another pro tip, this is the only jump scare, be aware of it, turn the volume down or something, I don't know, just, just know what's happening when you go into this room. Anyway, possibly the game's largest mechanic lies within spell casting. As you make your way through the game you'll encounter runes and you'll use these runes as ingredients to craft your own spells. For example, the protect rune and the self rune will create a magic barrier spell. You don't actually have to try and figure out every spell for yourself though. You'll find scrolls that'll teach you the mandatory ones you'll need to progress. Some of them have practical uses like spells for recovering sanity and health and the before mentioned barrier spell. You can also enchant weapons to do additional damage if you'd like. Beyond that, most of them are simply situational, you know, reveal invisible to reveal a hidden door, dispel magic to remove barriers, etc. Some of them I found to be really useless, like this one that summons a zombie, you only need it twice in the entire game, it's 
kind of dumb. There's three alignments that you can cast spells under. Okay, well, four if you find the hidden Mantarok one, but I'm not getting into that. The three alignments represent the three ancient gods, Ulioth, Zelatath, and Chaturga. There's two purposes to this alignment. Firstly, each one represents a different bar. Red is health, green is sanity, and blue is magic. So, say you cast a recover spell under Chaturga, it'll recover health, while under Zelatath, it'll recover sanity. This applies to any spell surrounding regeneration generation or aiding yourself in one way or another. It does sound a little bit complicated, but it becomes really easy once you stop saying the names of the gods and just say red, green, and blue. Now, the secondary purpose is for using spells on the environment. There's this rock, paper, scissors cycle. Blue beats red, red beats green, and green beats blue. So say if there's a blue barrier, cast the green version of Dispel Magic and you'll get rid of it. In fact, this rock, paper, scissors aspect goes far enough to drive the entire plot. Depending on what god you got Pious to summon, you'll have to summon the corresponding god to defeat it. There's actually a bonus ending if you give the game three playthroughs, getting Pious to summon all three gods in the process. I really do like this game's plot. It's not as deep as you'd expect from a plot that takes place over 2,000 years, but it is really satisfying to see all of these characters you've played as become connected to one another. You'll retread a lot of familiar territory in this game. The mansion, for example. It's the setting for Maximilian in the 1700s and Edward in the 50s, as well as Alex in the year 2000. But of course, with every time gap, every version of the mansion is a little bit different. The same thing applies to every level, which I do like. However, it's not really that convincing sometimes. I mean, considering that almost a thousand years have passed between visits in some of these stages, it really just doesn't look different enough. Like, I'm sure the stone would have decayed a little more in these temples over the course of like 600 years, you know, stuff like that. I guess it's a nitpick, but I do think a little more effort into the finer detail could have given off a better sense of age. The game's presentation has aged fairly roughly. These are definitely not the prettiest character models you'll ever see, but what really stuck out to me was the frequent use of stock sound effects. I've heard a lot of these sounds hundreds of times before in many other games and other forms of media, so they stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Some sounds really could have been better too. I mean, for crying out loud, the blood sound effect sounds like a bottle of ketchup. The cast is pretty good though. Alex is voiced by the lovely Jennifer Hale. In fact, there's a lot of voice actors from Metal Gear Solid on board. David Hayter, Cam Clark, amongst many others. The same studio did make that Metal Gear Solid remake, so it almost makes me think that they just had the actors in the studio and were like, hey, while you're here, can you just say a couple more lines for us? I mean, I mean, a lot of them do not have very many lines. Hayter voices these Roman guys and he says like two things. Oh wait, hang on. Twin Snakes came out two years after Eternal Darkness. Oh. Never mind. I'm stupid. And who could forget Paul Eiding as the evil monk man? You are a fool for trying to save him, Anthony. He also voices Paul Luther, which was a pleasure to hear. eiding has got one of those remarkably unique and very charming voices. We've also got the DARPA chief's very own Greg Eagles as Michael Edwards, which was very fitting, I found. The Guardians know where I am, and I won't last the night. The one thing that ties all of these characters together is the Tome of Eternal Darkness. During everyone's journey to fight the good fight against Pius, they were in possession of this thing at one point in time. It's a really good way of explaining why everyone knows how to use the same magic, you know, from writing it in the Tome and passing it down to the next user. Though events do play completely out of order, it's not chronological, so that explanation's got some holes, but... Whatever, I'm not one to nitpick, I'm just, I'm just gonna pretend that explanation works, cause why not? The hallway you find it in is always the same one. You'll be mysteriously teleported to a chamber made from tortured souls. Oh, the way the floor has these animated screamy faces. Oh, that makes me uncomfortable. I don't like that. It kind of looks like Noroi. Anyone ever watched that movie? Anyway, a cool detail is that there's statues of every character who's met their demise while in possession of the tome. It's cool. The tome itself has a pretty nice design too, you know, bound together by human flesh and bone. It represents the pause screen as well, which was a nice touch. You'll also get to see it on the game over screen. Okay, I don't know why, but this screen has always creeped me out a lot. Uh, it's, it, I think it's gotta be that skull dude like it's got eyeballs and it's like and you know and, like I know I like I just hate it like I I mean I hate it in a good way but like no, I hate it dude like no oh no can we just like can we oh, yeah
Okay, so yeah, that's Eternal Darkness. A little bit rough in a couple of areas, but it's still a fairly solid game today. 15 years later and the sanity effects are still as cool as ever, and the game's got a fairly satisfying and enjoyable plot. Gameplay-wise, it's kind of like a baby's first Silent Hill, but there is enough spin to make things unique with the magic system and whatnot. If you're interested, it is a pretty safe bet. I'd also recommend it as the first game you should play if you want to get into the survival horror genre. It's definitely not as groundbreaking now as it was back then. I mean, holy crap, those accolades. It's not as good as a Silent Hill game, I'm gonna tell you right now. So, those review scores, they don't ring as true today as they did back then, but even still, this is an experience that even today, you're only going to get playing Eternal Darkness. I really do not know why no other game has tried to play with the same concept. You know, all those fourth wall breaking effects to make the player question their own sanity. I mean, I guess Amnesia had a sanity meter too, but that getting low just made the screen all wiggly. Come on guys, we need something cool. Something modern and fresh that utilizes this exact same idea. Well, there actually was a spiritual successor to Eternal Darkness up on Kickstarter a couple of years ago, even headed by Dennis Dyack himself. It was gonna be a Wii U game, utilizing the same sanity system from Eternal Darkness, but with modern gameplay. When I heard about this, I got kind of excited. Like, imagine all of the fourth wall breaking effects they could do with the Wii U gamepad. That could have been freaking rad, dude. The game was called Shadow of the Eternals, and it did not meet its funding goal, because at the time, everybody was way way too busy sucking mighty number nines big fat floppy rubber cock. No really, I distinctly remember being so mad about this. You couldn't log into anywhere without seeing Mighty Number no. 9 in your feed 24-7. The game had already met its goal, but people were still sharing it non-stop. Gotta hit those stretch goals, gotta hit those stretch goals. The campaign completely overshadowed the Kickstarter for Shadow of the Eternals, just because they happened to launch around the same time, so... I hope you guys are happy you funded a bad Mega Man game when we could have funded a bad Eternal Darkness game. I say bad, I really shouldn't, but you know, I just don't really have that much faith in Dennis Dyack anymore. He's had a pretty bad track record for game development after Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes, but not only that, he's done some very questionable things too. I mean, do I even need to bring up the Epic Games lawsuit? Way to end your own career, dude. Supposedly Shadow of the Eternals is still on the table, but I really wouldn't think too much of it if I were you. I mean, I'm sure it'll at least be an interesting game if it ever sees the light of day, and I would still love to play it, but honestly, if this idea were to be modernized, it'd have to be by a younger generation, a newer studio that kinda understands a modern game design a little bit better than Silicon Knights, but regardless, to this day, 15 years later, Eternal Darkness still remains king of this category. Will somebody else take that throne, or shall this game remain there eternally?